Today I'm going to be talking about John Carpenter's obscure little horror movie from the 70s called Halloween, since it's almost Halloween. Apparently only a few people were lucky enough to see this movie when it was released, and it had very minimal impact on the course of horror movies for years to come. It's really a hidden gem that I'm excited to share with you nearly 40 years after its release. And if you're lucky, you might be able to find a working VHS copy on eBay, and you can go watch it at your parents' or grandparents' house. Okay, if you're not a millennial, just go along with this ruse. I was hoping that teenagers would believe me, or not. Now, Halloween is a perfect example of a movie that proves less is more. There's barely any blood or violence, and there's nothing in this movie that would suggest it had a sizable budget of any kind. Yet it still works. John Carpenter builds the tension magnificently by putting his characters in familiar and vulnerable positions and then not have Michael do anything, just stalk them and bide his time. The terror is psychological. Your imagination is far more effective than showing gratuitous blood and gore. That's not to say that gore isn't an effective device in horror movies, because it is and can be done with some artistic merit. Even back in the 70s, you had some horror movies that ramped the gore factor up to levels that are rarely even seen today. Yet this was the movie that spawned all the classic horror franchises of the 80s, for better or worse. Though you still give honorable mention to George Romero, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Exorcist, Italian slasher movies. Horror geeks no more, but I'll stop there. The movie starts with a six-year-old Michael Myers killing his sister. He's a sweet-looking little boy in a clown costume that snaps and becomes catatonic. It's an evil version of the movie Awakenings. Maybe he needed Robin Williams as his doctor and he would have become well-adjusted. I wonder what Michael was like in preschool. Did his parents get him a Chucky doll? I suppose he thinks his sister is a bad babysitter for neglecting him and fooling around with her boyfriend instead. And he wakes up in the asylum 15 years later and decides to reenact his crime, since he must have had an epiphany that all teenage girls are bad babysitters and hoes and deserve to be punished on Halloween, no less. It's a cautionary tale about premarital sex and being a bad influence on young children. It also taught me that stalking is bad, though I didn't think asking the same girl to the prom 12 times would be considered stalking, but I'm much the wiser. I stood outside her window in a Starfleet uniform instead of an altered William Shatner mask. I said, going to the prom with me will be out of this world. Bones! She didn't think so, but to me that's neither here nor there. This was Jamie Lee Curtis's film debut, and she plays the sheltered nerd who dresses like a librarian, Laurie Strode. Her fear is convincing as Michael torments her. She really does seem like a good girl, unlike her friends, one of whom is played by PJ Souls, who I also remembered in the movie Stripes as another bimbo type. Her other friend that plays Annie has a sarcastic attitude and brings some personality to her character. One coincidental side note is the little girl that plays the girl that Annie babysat grew up to be on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, according to Wikipedia. Just think, at this point she has a more successful career than John Carpenter. How sad is that? Donald Pleasance is iconic as the psychiatrist Dr. Loomis, the only person in the medical establishment who takes Michael Myers seriously as a threat. He must have worked at the most inept psychiatric ward ever. If no one else was concerned when Michael attacked a nurse and escaped, his superiors were like, sure he murdered his sister with a butcher knife while wearing a clown suit and stared in the space for 15 years, but there's no reason to involve the police. Dr. Loomis will talk some sense into him and give him a lollipop and they'll be back by dinner. It's done. Donald Pleasance is a great actor, and I don't want to go as far as saying he was miscast for this role as he was underutilized. He was excellent at playing villains who were quite mad in his career, like Nazi SS villain Heinrich Himmler, Shakespearean villains, and the James Bond villain Blowfield, who was the inspiration for Dr. Evil and Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget. It's like if they got the guy who plays Loki, Tom Hiddleston, and asked him to play Green Lantern. It just wouldn't be a good fit. Donald Pleasance also seems really low-key in this role, like he's aware of the gravity of the situation but almost doesn't believe in himself because it seems so surreal. Maybe his character prescribed himself some Valium and he played the part accordingly. There are also times when the constraints of the low budget are readily apparent. For Halloween, this town seems dead. Where are all the decorations and the kids trick-or-treating? 
For Illinois, this town seems downright balmy. And it doesn't make any sense that these kids' parents are out of town and they have to stay inside instead of going out in a costume. And Lori's friends just want to get drunk and laid instead of going to a party and getting drunk and laid. I guess they didn't have the budget for a party scene. For me, this is one of the movies I want to watch around Halloween. Way more than most of the countless imitators that followed in the 80s. The techniques used to make this film scary still hold up to this day. You're sitting on the edge of your seat holding your breath. And the theme song is chilling. It's timeless and not a gimmick. So go out and have an awesome Halloween. But don't go overboard. Like, don't eat too much candy like these kids. And don't have autoerotic asphyxiation phone sex with Casper. Thank you for watching and I hope you'll be back for my next video.